precious and how sweet the story of Jesus is. That's exactly what we've been looking at uh, for uh, quite some time now, dating back to uh, the beginning of uh, 2020. We began and started in the book of John and uh, began looking at this. We're winding our way down now and coming to an end. We only have a couple of chapters left. I want you to go this morning, take your Bibles to John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20 with me this morning, and we'll get there in just a moment. You know, if I were to tell you this morning, if I were to say I have some news for everyone, and uh, I want to share this news with you, um, I've kept it in for a while, but uh, now I'm going to go ahead and tell everyone that I'm next in line for the throne of England. I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> if I were to tell you that and I were to say, look, I, I'll show it. Tell somebody, they just, it just they, they sound smart if they have a British accent or, a, or at least the, the, know, some, some, some people do anyway. And uh, uh, I don't know, I, you know, Scottish accent or something like that, British accent, you know. Uh, but I say, look, I'll start talking with a British accent and uh, that I, I'll show you that I am the next in line for the throne of England. You'd say, that's probably not going to do it. And I will uh, take a crayon and mark on a page, and I'll say, well, my father's 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 father was here, and they're from England, and therefore there's royalty in my blood, and there we go. I'm next in line. You're going to say, yeah, crayon on a paper is probably not going to do it for me. And uh, you're probably just going to, no matter what I do, Chances are you're going to probably say, you know what, that, um, that doesn't quite cut it. You're going to have to, what would the words be? You're going to have to prove it. You're going to have to prove it. You see, you're, you're going to have to be able to go and you're going to have to be able to take records and you're going to have to go back and, and you're going to have to be able to show for sure who you are in order to prove that you're in line You've got to be able to show me something more. The flesh. I, I know I'm asking you to go back a long way here, but think about Jesus' life and ministry. John picks up and John tells us of the very first miracle and then goes through the entire book of John and he shows us these signs that point us back to the fact that Jesus was and is God. Think about <clears throat> the water turned into wine. They were astounded <clears throat> at that miracle, the first of Jesus' miracles there when He was in Cana of Galilee. But He showed that He had power over, I mean, to be able to take water and turn it into wine, to be able to have that power to do that, they were amazed at that. And then think about as we begin to go through John, John chapter 3, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus, one of the rulers of the Pharisees. And he has that conversation with Nicodemus and he tells him how, how he must have eternal life and how he must be born again. And he told him his purpose for coming that Jesus, chapter number 4, he goes and he meets the woman at the well. You remember the woman at Samaria and Jesus meets with her, the, the woman at the well there and and there he has a conversation with her. He begins to tell this woman all the things that she's ever done. And she, wins, she says, all, all, she wants to talk about worship. Well, your fathers say that Jerusalem's place to worship. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And she wants to change the subject. And Jesus comes back and he brings her back to the point of understanding who she is. He says, listen, you, you're not married right now. You're, you've, you've had five husbands. The man that you're living with right now is not your husband. Listen, you need to understand the truth. And, and, and he tells her, I am the what? The, I'm the living water. He says, if you'll, thir if you'll take of me, you'll never thirst again. She goes back to the city of Samaria. She says, come see a man. Here in John chapter number 4, we see a healing of the nobleman's son. This nobleman comes to Jesus and says, Lord, please, will you come and heal my son? And Jesus says, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. And he says, Lord, you don't even have to come down. Just say the word. And if you'll just speak the word, he can be healed. And Jesus says, go thy way. Your son is healed. 
And sure enough, he turns around and goes home and he runs into uh, some of his servants that are coming back. And they say, your son's healed. And he says, what time? And he says, it was yesterday at this time. And he knew that that was when Jesus spoke. Jesus showed that he had control over sickness from a distance. He didn't even have to be there. All he had to do was speak the word. We had the healing at John chapter 5. There's the lame man there at, the, at Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda. And, and he didn't have anybody to help him get into the water, he said. When the angel comes down and, and the waters are stirred, he says, I got, I got nobody to help put me in there. But Jesus goes in and Jesus says, I, I, I'll make you whole. And so Jesus makes him whole and he stands up and he walks. In John chapter 6, we have the feeding of the 5,000. There's 5,000 men. We, we call it the feeding of the 5,000 because the Bible says that there are 5,000 men, and then it says plus women and children. So if a crowd was a, a husband and a wife and a kid, there could have been 15,000 or more people there. We don't know, that, but the Bible says 5,000 men plus women and children. And so here they are, and, and this little boy has five loaves and two fishes. Not five loaves of bread like this, like that would make a difference for 5,000 people, right? Uh, but, 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 but just the, this, this little lunch, this little, uh, it was a lunchable, okay? All right, that's what it was. That was that's what you said. There was lunchables in the Bible. Jesus used one to feed the, okay, no. But he takes that and he begins to, he blesses it, the Bible says, and he begins to break it. And he begins to give and give and give, and they just keep passing out. And there are 12 baskets that remain after everybody's eaten as much as they want. They had a buffet from five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus showed that he had power over that. Jesus walks on the water in John chapter number 6, showing that he had power over nature. In John chapter 8, one of my favorite passages, he gets into a discussion with the Pharisees there. And he says something. They say, how can you uh, only be, you're not even yet 40, and you're saying that Abraham rejoiced to see your day. How can that even be? Abraham's dead and gone. You're not even 40. That was thousands of years ago. And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. It was a powerful statement. It was a statement of I am. He's saying, I am Jehovah. I am God. I am the eternal one. And the Bible says that they picked up stones to stone him. And they said, he says, for, for, for what, 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 what have I done that you're going to stone me? And they said, oh, not for anything bad, but you've done, but for blasphemy because you've made yourself to be equal with God. He knew exactly what he was saying. By the way, Jehovah's Witnesses in that passage will say uh, uh, they misunderstood Jesus. No, no, no. They knew exactly what Jesus Jesus was saying, and that's why they picked up stones to throw at him because he was claiming to be God. He claimed earlier on in his life, early on in his ministry, that he had the same power to heal that the Father had, that he had the same power to save as the Father had, that he had the same power to create as the Father had. And he goes through, and he says there in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. It's a great passage. He's declaring, I am God. In John chapter 9, we have the healing of the man that was born blind. Uh, here was a man who, uh, disciples, they, they ask, you know, well, who sinned? You know, him or his parents? A as if he had sinned in the womb, you know, before he ever came out because he was born blind. And uh, they, they said, who sinned, him or his parents? Jesus said, neither, but, that, but that, that the Son of Man might be glorified because I'm about to do something special here, is what he was saying. And here Jesus heals this man that was born blind. And all the people, they go, we've never seen this blind and been blind his whole life for Jesus to come along and to heal him. We've never seen that before. They saw and they knew and they understood there was something special that was going on. In John chapter number 10, Jesus says that he's the good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. He says, and I give unto them eternal life. I know them by name. Hey, aren't you glad this morning that God knows you by name? Aren't you glad this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ knows your name and that he knows who you are and that he was willing to come for you and that he was willing to die for you and he was willing to be buried and rise again for you? He knows your name. He says, my sheep know my name. I know my sheep's name. They know my voice. And he says, he goes on in that same passage to say this, I and my Father are one. And once again, they're ready to stone him. John chapter number 11, we have Jesus coming to Bethany. There's a man by the name of Lazarus that's been sick, and he dies. And his sisters Mary and Martha there, they come to Jesus. They say, oh, if you would have just been here sooner, if you would have just been here while he was sick, you could have healed him. You could have saved him. And Jesus says, where is he? And he goes there and he cries out with a loud voice. The Bible says, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says that here comes Lazarus walking out of that tomb with his grave clothes bound about him. And Jesus says, cut him and let him loose. 
Here he comes walking out. Amen for that. Amen. What did he just show? He just showed he had power over death. So you say all of those things could have had enough. All of those things could have happened, but if we don't get to John chapter 20 and have what takes place in John chapter 20, then none of that matters. I want you to go with me in John chapter number 20. I want you to look at verses, I'm going to skip ahead to the end of the chapter and then come back and work our way back through it here. I want you to look at John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31. What were all of these things that were written before and then what we're going to see here in John chapter 20, his resurrection, what, what were they all written for? What was the purpose of it? John 20 verse number 30, look at what he says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through days of Jesus' ministry while He was here on the earth. That's all combined in the four Gospels. Yet Jesus' total ministry was about three and a half years long, which comes to about 1,000 in 80 days. That means we only have recorded about 5% of Jesus' ministry. John says there are many other things that Jesus did. These signs did Jesus, and these are written for what purpose? That ye might believe. That you might believe. That I might believe. That a person could pick up this Bible and pick up the Word of God and read the book of John and read what it says about who Jesus was, that He came as a baby, that He was born, that He was uh, the Lamb of God that John the Baptist talked about that takes away the sin of the world, that we would read through and come to a point that we might believe that, yes, that man, that man Jesus, he wasn't just a man. He was the Son of God. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. He was the one that we have been waiting for as far as the Jews were concerned. He was the Messiah that they've been waiting for. As far as you and I as Gentiles are, uh, we are thankful that looking back, He was the Savior not just of the Jews, but of the Gentiles as well. And that we can be welcomed in, that we can have eternal life. How? The verse says it there, by believing ye might have life through His name. Here on the pages of Scripture. Have you ever had somebody say, if God would just give me a sign, I'd believe. You ever talk to somebody who said, well, I don't really believe in God and I don't really believe Jesus and all that stuff and everything, but if there was some sort of sign, if He would show me something, I'd believe. I'm here to submit to you and to tell you this morning that we have all that we need to believe that Christ is God and to have eternal life through Him. And it's found right here in the Word of God. We do not need anything else. We don't need anything more. There's no extra revelation that's needed. There's nothing that's needed from any other prophet or teacher or anything else. We have everything that we need to know in order to have and to receive Christ as our Savior and to receive and, and understand there is a measure of, of, of blind faith, so to speak, when we, when we step out by trust and, and step out by faith to trust Christ because we can't have, we don't have a video evidence in front of us, okay? We weren't there when it happened. So there is a measure of, of faith, but our faith is not based on emptiness, okay? Go back to what I told you this morning. If I were to say, I am next in line for the throne of England, and some of you started to come up and you said, blind faith, okay? I've got nothing to prove it. I've got nothing wherewith to show you. And you say, oh, well, you started talking with a British accent. That'll do. Okay, no, that's not proof of anything, okay? But Jesus didn't just say, I'm God, okay, and then give us no proof whatsoever. Our faith is not a blind leap. He went on to say this, it is a reasonable step based on strong evidence. We have strong evidence this morning that Jesus was exactly who He said He was. We have strong evidence, and the greatest evidence that we have is His resurrection when He rose bodily from the grave. So I want to preach that, that to you this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to preach this message. We've gone through in the book of John. It is for naught if Jesus Christ died and did not rise again from the grave. Everything that you and I believe as a Christian, everything that you and I believe uh, and everything that we live for is of naught if Christ did not rise again. But aren't you thankful this morning that He did? 
that wasn't a very loud response there. Aren't you glad this morning that he did? Amen. Okay, all right, all right, a little bit better that time. You better be, because if he didn't, there's no hope, the Bible says. But we have hope this morning in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have hope in a risen Savior. We have hope in the one who said he was God and then showed that he was God. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to go through this passage this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be back here this morning, to be able to preach your word. Lord, I pray that you would be with me now. I pray that you would give me power this morning. I pray that you give me strength. I pray that you would be with my voice, Father. Help me to say only that which is necessary this morning. Help me to point people to the Word of God. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God would do a work in lives this morning. Lord, I don't know that there's one here that does not know you, but Lord, if they are and there's someone here that's never trusted you, I pray that this morning, that today would be the day that it never trusted Christ. If there's someone here that does not have an absolute assurance of their salvation, Lord, I pray that today that they would step forward, that they would trust Christ as their Savior. Lord, for those of us that do know you, for those that are here who are believers, I pray that today would be a, a message of, of blessing and a message of remembrance and a message of thankfulness of who you are and of what you've done. What May we never forget the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we never forget it's not just something that we celebrate once a year around Easter time. It's not just something that we can uh, look to at one time of the year. No, Lord, it's what we live our very lives for. It's what we are, are, have strength in day by day to be able to go and to live for you. And I pray this morning that you would help us to see that in the Word of God. Lord, may you use this message to strengthen and encourage your people. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Go with me now to John chapter number 20. We're going to begin reading the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. She comes and she tells Peter and John. John mentions himself here uh, as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's the way he refers to himself here in the book of John. So Mary Magdalene, you remember her life and remember what Christ had done in her life. She, he had cast out seven demons from her and a, a woman who was uh, very near and dear and, and, and close to her Savior. She, she loved Him immensely. She was there uh, at the cross and she was there here now um, looking for His body and wanting to uh, finish the burial that they were not able to do because of the uh, Sabbath that, had, that was taken put him in the tomb there, and uh, now she's coming uh, on this Sunday morning. She's coming to the gravesite. She's coming to try to find him, and, and the Bible says that when she gets there, she, she sees the stone rolled away, and she goes and she runs to Peter and to John, and, and she comes and tells them they've taken away the Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth, verse number 3, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to that sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. John's a little bit faster than Peter was. It says, And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Uh, here we see John being a little reserved. He outruns Peter there to the tomb, but he gets there, and he doesn't go inside. He stops, and he kneels down. I want you to see here in these first few verses, I want you to see the reaction to the resurrection. The reaction to the resurrection we have Peter here who, who comes then in verse number 6. Watch what it says. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher. It was not in Peter's nature or in his blood to stop or slow. He runs right inside of it. He doesn't stop outside like John did. He just goes right on in. And the Bible says, verse 6, He seeth the linen clothes lying, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. All right, so... Here we have Peter going in. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 12, I want you to hear this verse. The Bible says, Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. The first reaction that we see here is Peter, and it's one of amazement. He was amazed at what was taking place. The Bible uses the word here that he, he wondered. It's translated as wondered or marveled or amazed. He is amazed at what's going on. He's not quite connect, connecting the dots, so to speak, just yet. He's just amazed at what's going on here. 
Here's the linen clothes. Here, here, here's the napkin that's laid up here. What's going on? He's amazed at what has taken place and what's happening. And he goes away wondering, marveling at what's going on. Here we have John then in verse number 7. I'm sorry, verse number 8. It says, Then went in also the, that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw, no, now watch this, and believed. He saw and believed. We have Peter who was amazed, but now we have... They knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't know. They didn't remember the Scripture. They didn't remember what the Old Testament said. They didn't remember what David had written about in one of the Messianic Psalms talking about how Christ's body would not be left to be corrupted, how that he was going to rise again. They had missed that. I'm so thankful that even for the Word of God, He takes them through the Psalms, He takes them through the prophets, and He tells them about who He was, and He teaches them and reminds them what the Bible says about who Christ was in His death and His burial and His resurrection. And the disciples, they weren't quite there. They didn't quite get it. But here's Peter, and here's John. Peter's amazed. He's marveling at what's going on. John comes in, and he sees it, and he is assured that Jesus was exactly who he had said he was. Notice in verse number 10, the disciples went away again unto their own home. But look at verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. We have Mary here, who her reaction, she's in agony still. She's, the Bible has, uses the word here for, for weeping. It's, a, it's an uncontrollable cry. She is in pain. She's in agony. She's in misery right now. But now she, she just wanted to come and to pay one more moment of respect and, and to, to, to see that, that he is uh, taken care of and that his body is taken care of. And she just wants one more opportunity to do that. And now his body is gone too. And she says, listen, they've taken him away and I don't know where he is. And now she comes back. She's followed Peter and John back. And here she is just sitting outside and she's weeping uncontrollably. She's in agony. She's in pain and she's hurting. Notice in verse number 12, it says that she stoops down, verse 11 says, and she looked in the sepulcher, and she sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? You know, I, I love this. Jesus, he never asks a question for information. He, he's not looking. Jesus already knows, okay? There's no need for him. Here she is. She's weeping. She's crying. And he says, he, Jesus asked the question. He says, Why are you weeping? Why are you crying? If they had listened to Christ's teaching, he, he had already talked to them and told them about how he was going to have to die and be buried and rise again. He had said things like, uh, tear down this temple and three days I will, uh, I will bring it back up. I'll build it up again. I'll, I'll rise again. And they're like, how are you going to build it in three days? What are you going to do? He was talking about himself. He was talking about his death and burial and resurrection. If they had listened and paid attention, they would have known. And there would not there would have been the need for all this agony. There would not have been the need for all the weeping. There wouldn't have been the need for all the crying. There should have been rather not agony, not, not amazement. There should have been anticipation. There should have been a, here it comes, day one, day two, day three, here Sunday morning, get ready, it's about to happen. How many of you, um, uh, when you get ready, to? Now, he just had a birthday a couple of days ago, and, and uh, he's counting that, how many more days, how many more days, how many more days, you know, he's get, like, the day before, he's like, one more day, you know, he's all excited, he's like, Daddy, it's what, do you remember? His favorite phrase is, do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? He says, do you remember? And, and so the day before, do you remember that tomorrow's my birthday? I mean, he's, he's excited. He's looking forward to it with anticipation. He's thrilled because he knows it's coming. And I told him, no, we canceled your birthday this year. You got to wait till next time. He's like, wait, no, 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 no. So well, no, there's anticipation, there's excitement about it. That's what it should have been with the disciples and followers of Jesus if they were paying attention. Here they go. She's in agony. And so Jesus asked this question for examination. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And then he asked this, whom seekest thou? 
And she supposes that he's the gardener. And the Bible says that she goes through and she says, oh, oh please, if you take him. I mean, you've, you've got to uh, give her some credit for, for wanting to so much uh, to take care of her Savior and, and, and what she's thinking. But, but her thinking is wrong here because here she is. You've got to credit her for her devotion to Christ. But yet here she is. She's crying and she's weeping and she's in agony because she's got the wrong view. And Jesus says in verse number 15, uh, she tells him, she says, I'll take him away. And then verse number 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Mary. Just one word. Spurgeon said Jesus spoke the greatest message in one word. Mary. Mary. And she turns She sees the Lord, the Bible says. She recognizes who he is, and she calls him Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, verse 17, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. And say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things. Hopefulness of what is taking place and what has happened. And she is now excited to go and to tell others about what Christ has done, that He is resurrected. She says, I have seen the Lord. Now, in other passages, the sad thing is, here comes Mary and here comes all those other ladies that were there. John doesn't tell about it, but in other passages, we have other ladies that were there, uh, Mary and uh, other Mary and and then Joanna and uh, different ones that were there. And they come and they uh, tell the disciples, we've seen the risen Savior. And the Bible says, disciples come, no. No, we don't believe it. We don't believe it. And so Jesus comes later, verse number 19. Then the Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. We see the disciples here, their initial reaction is that they are afraid. Their initial action is that they are afraid. The Bible says that uh, they were fearful but here it turns in. You know, when somebody comes back from the dead and they have risen under their own power, I'd say some of the first things that they speak and say are some pretty important things uh, to grab hold of and to listen to. So I want you to see here in this passage in verses 19 through 23, I want you to see some of the results of the resurrection. What resulted at, because Christ raised from the dead? What is a result and what does he say to his disciples? Notice, first of all, peace and joy. Verse 19 and 20 He comes there, he's in the midst of them, and he says to them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and he says it twice, Peace be unto you when he comes in. Then he says to them again, Peace be unto you. The Bible says when they see the Lord, now they are glad, they are excited to see the risen Savior. Look in verse number 22 then. I'm sorry, verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. There's peace and there's joy. But here now in this next verse, we see that Christ has a plan for His followers. There's a plan for His followers. And what is the plan? He says, listen, just like my Father sent me, I'm going to go and send you. Listen, don't, don't miss this. Every time that Jesus came to someone here, Immediately after he speaks to them, he tells them to go and to tell somebody else about his resurrection. When he runs into Mary, he tells them to go and tell. When he runs into the women, he tells them to go and tell the disciples. When he comes in here to the disciples, he says, just like my father uh, sent me, I'm about to send you. He's going to finish his time on the earth with telling them, go and tell them about the Savior who died and was buried and rose again. Don't miss this, that one of the greatest results of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that you and I have news to go and tell. That That's God's plan to to go and to promote the gospel to those around us. See, if, if Christ wanted to, He could have said, Now I'll stay and I'll go and I'll tell and I'll preach the gospel to everybody now that I'm risen from the dead. I'll go and I'll do that and people will believe as they see me. But that's not how He chose to do it. He could have said, now I'm going to send a legion of angels to go and to tell the world and to tell everybody else about what's happened. Because now I'm risen from the dead and now there are people that can see it and angels can testify to it and I'll send them out. But that's not what he does. 
He says, listen, I'm risen from the grave. Here I am. See me. See who I am. See my hand. See my side. And, and then he says, I'm going to send you out that you can go and tell others. One of the results of the resurrection is that God has a plan for his followers. And the plan is to go and to tell. The plan is to be sent forth and to preach and teach the gospel to those in this world. The Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. You say, wait a minute, the, the, the disciples, the apostles there, they had power to forgive sins? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is, you go forth with this message of the Lord Jesus Christ. You go forth and you teach the gospel. And as you do that, when, when people hear the gospel and they believe, they are going to be forgiven of their sins. They are going to come and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. They... <clears throat> their lives are going to be changed. And, I, and he breathes on them and tells them to receive the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Excuse me. And gives them the power to be able to follow through on what they have been told and instructed to do here. Say, so, well, I'm not able, to, I'm not able to, to, to talk to people very well. I'm not very good at sharing the gospel. I'm not very good at doing this. You have everything that you need in order to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit of God that lives with you. Have the Holy Spirit's power. If you will live in, that, in the Holy Spirit, you walk in the Holy Spirit, you can have, and, and, and the Holy Spirit, the, the power of the Holy Spirit can be upon you, and your life can, you can give that gospel witness to those around you as you have that Holy Spirit living within you. Well, I'm not able to do that. Yes, you can. Well, I'm not really good at doing that. Yes, you can. See, this wasn't given to just us. It wasn't just for the apostles to go and tell. It wasn't just for those 10 that were gathered there in that upper room that day. It's for every believer of all time for the last 2,000 plus years. In these closing verses here in John 24 through 31, let's look at them together quickly now. We've seen the reaction to the resurrection. Peter, he was amazed. John was assured of who Jesus was. Mary was in agony. The disciples were afraid. What they should have had was an anticipation the results of the resurrection, there's a peace and there's a joy that came when Christ walked into that room that night. They were afraid, but it, their, their, their fear turned to joy, it turned to gladness, it turned to peace when they saw the resurrected Savior, and that's what He still brings today. He has a plan for His followers. He has power. He gives power through the Holy Spirit of God to be able to do that. And I want you to notice here as we close, though, the reason through faith in Christ. That was the reason for the resurrection. It was to prove that Jesus was who He said He was. It was to prove that He was God in the flesh. And when He was buried and when He rose on that third day, when He came out of the grave on that Sunday morning, the Bible says that He then gave and had the power to give eternal life to as many as would believe on Him. In verses 30 and 31, describe that and describe the purpose for this writing. But I want you to see in verse number 24, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He wasn't there. We don't know why he wasn't there. We're not sure the reason with him. It's just the other ten. We don't know why he's not there. We don't know uh, the purpose of, uh, of what was going on. But I want you to see a, a bold proclamation that he makes here in verse number 25. It says, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. A bold proclamation. I will not believe. If I, if I don't get to put my hands in his hands, if I don't get to thrust my hand into his side where, where the, the, the spear went into, if I don't get to do that, I will not believe. You know, I was telling some of the men earlier that um, I, I missed being with you and missed the Wednesday night of the, before being here, and um, I missed being with God's people. I miss being with the church and miss being with other believers. And uh, I know this passage here in particular, the Bible doesn't condemn Thomas for not being there, but there's always something that's missed when there's an opportunity to be with God's people and you're not with God's people. There's always something that's missed when you have a chance to be around fellow believers or you're not. Thomas missed one of the biggest things that, that ever occurred. 
Here, here the, the disciples were together, and they had a chance and opportunity. Thomas could have been there. I, I don't know why he's God's people. You, you miss the opportunity for the fellowship. You miss the opportunity to hear the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. You miss the opportunity to be edified and encouraged in the Lord. And you miss that. When there's opportunity for God's people to come together, there ought to be uh, a desire to do so. And uh, Because there are things that you miss when they're not here, and you're missed uh, when you're not with God's people. But here he says there in verse number 25, I will not believe. A bold proclamation. Look at verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Aren't you looking forward to the day when you have a, a resurrected body and you're just able to just go poof and just appear right inside of a room, scare your kids to death, wouldn't it? I mean, could, could you imagine being able to do that right now and just uh, boom, right there? And, but that's what Jesus, apparently that's what Jesus does here. Here he is to Thomas, and he gives them the bodily proof that Thomas asked for. Thomas made a bold proclamation, but Jesus comes back and he gives them the bodily proof. And by the way, this is why, this is one of the reasons we believe in a bodily resurrection, okay? It wasn't just Christ's spirit that rose. It wasn't just a, a, a ghostly form that came to them. Notice, read with me. I want you to see this in verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not believe." If I can't put my fingers into his hands, if I can't put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe that there's a resurrected Savior. I'm not going to believe that Jesus is alive. And Jesus comes to him in body and says, Here, Thomas, come here. Put your finger right there. Put your hand right here. And he says, Be not faithful. I don't have that opportunity today. But notice what Jesus says. There's nobody in here that, can, that gets to have a bodily visit with Jesus Christ and go, yes, I see the nail marks. Oh, yes, that's where the spear was. We don't get to do that. But notice what Jesus says. Thomas, first of all, answers and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Another bold proclamation, but now the other way. He sees Jesus for who he is. He says to him, my Lord and my God. He recognizes Jesus as God in the flesh, the resurrected Savior. And he calls him my Lord and my God. Notice what Jesus says. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and believed. That's every one of us here this morning. You can't see Jesus Christ anymore. He doesn't walk around bodily upon the earth. But the Bible tells us we have a more sure word of testimony. Peter writes and talks about that more sure word, and this is what it is right here. It's the word of God. We can trust this more than you can trust seeing something with your own eyes. You can trust this. Peter said, we saw something, but we've got a more sure with our own eyes. And But he says, listen, there are eyewitness accounts uh, of seeing the Lord Jesus, and you and I, we have these signs. Verse number 30, John writes then, and says, we have these signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Listen, these are written, this account is written, the book of John was written so that you could see that He died for your sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again, that He proved that He was God in the flesh, that He proved that He was exactly who He said He was. Listen, if Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to bring myself back to life in three days... If he said that and he proved it and he did it, then we ought to trust everything else that he said. And he said that ye can only have life if you come to me. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John says you have enough to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have enough that you can put your faith and trust in him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Let me ask you, has there been that day, has there been that time in your life where you came to the conclusion that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself, but I believe what the Bible says about Jesus Christ and who He was. And I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ 
to save me from my sin. I have put my faith and trust. I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I've received eternal life through